Hi, everybody. Sorry for, again, the delay because of the keynote and the display. So I guess all my animations are gone. But once it's put up online, hopefully you hopefully can see it. So now we can only do this reduced version of animation. No animation at all. But uh, So I'm going to talk about, and I cannot see my slides here. I have to be turning all the time. Let me. So I'll be talking about uh, deep learning for chemical compound stability prediction. I see a large number of audience here. I assume you are deep learning experts or at least very interested in using deep learning in your research. So I'm sure the first part of the title will interest you, which says deep learning. Uh, but I'm not very confident about the second part. <laughs> if there's any condolence, I'm not myself, I'm not a uh, chemist or material scientist uh, at all. I'm a computer scientist. So I work with a bunch of very bright and enthusiastic material scientists to uh, set up this project. And they're interested in using cutting edge technology, machine learning technology, to make scientific discoveries, which interests me as well. So, so this is the piece of work um, that I did in school. So uh, I'm Roseanne, by the way, and we're from Northwestern University. So uh, there's supposed to be a big, flashy animation. But anyway, wait, uh, it's a little cut off. Okay, so for, for you guys, for the guys who know deep learning, you know that there are three components that are really important for deep learning, at, at, at least as of now. We're looking at the left side, right? So the big components are one, there's a, there, there's a deep neural network algorithm, which includes the architecture of the network, you know, the back propagation, and the, the enormous number of ways that everybody is so excited about. And there's a second part that's also very important for the success of deep learning, that is the availability of big data uh, that only happens in recent years. And the third component, of course, is a fast computing facility, which uh, currently just a lot of GPUs. So that's the left graph I'm we're looking at. And for this particular setup, we're going to use the success in deep learning, try to use it as a tool to solve problems in material uh, science. So what problems are we looking at? Before we get into the actual problems, I think it's incumbent for me to give you a little bit background in case you're not from material science or chemistry or anything related, um, that there's a big transition in this field of science discovery. So if you go back to you know, a couple of hundred years ago, people make science scientific discoveries by doing experiments, you know, physical experiments over and over again for uh, many years, and then people develop theories, right? And they write books and equations, things done about it, so they understand more about why that experiment was successful, why that discovery was made. And then people um, start to do computational simulations when they have computers set up. That's around the year of, you know, between uh, a little bit before 2000, 1980, I think. And then, just of uh, now, we're making, we're having this biggest transition ever, well, we will call it that, because we are data scientists. That, uh, that's called a data-driven science discovery. So now people are discovering new theories and new you know, uh, behaviors in science by learning from data, and hopefully learning from data by models automatically. So that's kind of the background. If you're interested, the two papers um, below, one of them is book, uh, that you can read about and describing how we're in this big transition of scientific, scientific discovery. And specifically to material scientists, they're extremely excited because this whole transition is pushed by government. So we go to the White House, dot com, dot gov, sorry, slash MGI, there's this big material genome initiative where the government is saying that we should push this, um, we should boost this, this movement forward, where we should use data-driven technology, we should use fast computing technology, everything that we are available in data mining to try to make materials discoveries. So we're, we're going to talk about what is materials discoveries. Um, okay, so this is blocking everything. This is supposed to be a... Uh, uh, animation, but so so I was asking. So remember the three components that we're talk talking about. So the first component is: Do we have fast computing um, in material society? Well, sure. You just need to buy a lot of GPUs. And the second 
component which is blocked by this whole thing, because this is supposed to come up later, uh, is that do we have big data? And the answer is yes, we do have big data in, in material science. Uh, as of now, at least it's good enough. It's not small data as it was before. So I show two uh, examples, websites that holds big enough data. One is called Materials Project, one is called OP OQMD, and the second one is the exact one that I'm using for this project. And they hold about, you know, for example, OQMD has about 300,000 compounds everything, almost everything that you can think of about the compounds calculated by simulation available there. So you can build any model you want, you know, connecting compound, compound structure with their property using whatever technology you want. So big data is there, fast computing is there, now is deep neural network there at all? And the answer is, we are the first one, so we did this as, as far as I know. I'm not uh, making, make, I'm making a bold uh, statement, but we're doing that, so people should be doing that. Um, okay, and then before we uh, jump into what exactly we're doing, again, I'm showing a, a little bit of background information, in case you're not from this society, that what interests people most in the field of computer, uh, sorry, in the field of material science. So that's what's called materials knowledge discovery, which is, you should be very familiar with, just materials plus KDD. Uh, that concerns with the relationships between four components, that is the processing, structure, property, and, pro and performance, known as PSPP. So very easily um, understanding is, is that how you process a material, like how you heat it up, how you, you know, max manufacturing it will, will affect is structure, um, that is you can understand as uh, say H2O, that is two molecules of hydrogen connect to oxygen, that's their structure. And the structure would affect the property of the water, you know, what form it is in, liquid form, solid form. And then the property would, of course, affect the, the pro performance in an, in, in an engineering setting. So there's this connection in these four components and there's relationship going on. People all believe that that's well known in the material society, but it's but it's not less clear that what exactly a relationship is there. If there is a, there's no kind of a clear math form to describe this relationship. So that provides us a big playground for us, you know, data scientists to, to work at. So that's kind of the scope that we're working at in this project, MKS. So particularly we're looking at the center two, um, you know, uh, circles. That is, we're looking at a structure of something and trying to predict is property. Um, to give a like, detailed example, if you're like, looking at water, this will be their structure, and you're looking at the property of it. So this is an, a, an example of another, actually not water, um, ternary, and the green would say that if you're um, having a st structure that's of this com, com uh, this composition, it would be stable. If it's red, it would be not be stable. So those things are obtained by either simulation or experiments, and those, those structures are known, but how to connect them to them uh, is less, well, less known. So the big question that we're asking is how much we, can we infer just by looking at the simple um, structure? So it will be more clear when you see the data that we're using. So this is the data we're using. So say even if you're not from chemistry background, you should know that compounds are made of elements and there are in total of, you know, 100 or so elements in the world. So if we just list their composition, which is the fraction of that element in a compound, if we just simply list in that, and then we have another column that lists a certain property, in this case uh, was called formation energy, that is how, how much energy it needs for the two elements to form a compound. If we just simply list that, what can we learn out of this, right? If we cannot learn out of this since we are not smart enough, can a deep neural network learn out of this? Because supposedly they're smarter than us. So that's the whole, <laughs> again, that should be an animation that this form flies up and then this big arrow going back. Anyway, so that's the network we're building and the input would just be the element, the fraction of all the elements, right? So say we have 100 or something of those, I just list you see, uh, connect each of them to a neuron. And then the output, again, would be just one neuron that says this is how much of the property that we're, looking, we're trying to predict. 
in this case, again, formation energy, how much energy it takes to form it. And that's why the title goes back to the stability of compounds, because formation energy indicates how stable a formed compound would be. So before I show you the result, which will be good, you know, of course, otherwise I, I shouldn't be standing here. But before I show you the result, we want to back up a little and ask ourselves, why are we doing this kind of structure, right? Why am I just using this as input and use this as output? Why are we just looking at composi composition as the atomic fraction? So the reason is this. I want to do end-to-end -end modeling. You know, everybody is in deep learning society. We want to look at very simple thing and try to connect it to a supposedly very complex thing and without you know, much of hand engineering in between. Hopefully the deep network will figure out how, uh, what kind of relationship they should be looking at between the elemental, uh, element compositions and all the way towards a complex uh, property. <laughs> and secondly, we want to make the model general. So I want to make sure this is understandable by people, you know, normal people, non-experts of material science. So, so that's why we choose to use this very raw form of input to the neural network, not some attributes that's, that are handmade by, say, a very uh, expert of the material science, which will be effective, I guess, but it will be less understandable. And thirdly, I want to improve the interoperability, which is, uh, again, you know, you would know from the first side of why, how, how this networks, why, how, what this network is doing. And also, I want to bridge the two societies together so a data scientist who doesn't know much about chemistry or material science will be able to understand the model, and a, a people from the other society, or, again, doesn't know much about neural network, would be able to use the model. So that's, that was the purpose. So now, we can look at some of the results, but again, before doing that, I'm going to show you what procedure we did with the data. Um, you know how there's a trend in deep learning society that we should do less of data mining in the sense of they're downplaying the, the, the work that people should interfere with the data, but we are sh we're finding that there's still things that you better do with your data before you fit it into the big deep neural network. That is, uh, you better do some data cleaning, remove some of the outliers. Well, what we do is, you know, we remove uh, the single element materials because they're not making sense, they, they don't have formation energy, and then we move out of bound energy um, compounds that are, you know, just wrongly calculated in the form, and then we remove the values of out of, outside of a five sigma statistical bound, and we show that um, actually after all this removal, we, we have some kind of 16% improvement. So just some, you know, tips that you can, you guys can follow. And we're uh, splitting the set into nine versus one, training and test. And some analysis show that is, is probably not very clear, but um, most part of the data are ternaries, which means three elements forming a compound. And a little bit of them are quarteries and above, and, and about 12% of them are binaries. Uh, sorry, 6% of them are binaries, 12% are quarteries and above. So. Let's look at what network structure we're building. Um, it's actually not super deep com compared to you know recent things that like ComNAS that deals with images and stuff. Yes. Okay. Um, so we're building just like an MLP for five, seven, and nine layers, uh, where the rest are in this case there's a dropout and very common recipe you'll be seeing SGD, you know, mini batch and everything. Um, and we do. Uh, and, and the innovation that we made is we do random initialization and another was called probabilistic initialization where uh, the initialization of a node has to do with the percentage of that element, uh, element's appearance in the data. So, um, so we can see if you compare random initialization and probabilistic initialization, you see improvement um, following these arrows. Um, the lower the better, so you see improvements there. So, um, so this thing is supposed to move up, but uh, so you, if we plot them in curves, you would see that for the pairs of P and R, that is probabilistic initialization and random initialization, you will see, always see a consistent improvement uh, for between the two. The same structure, same everything, but different initialization really helps. So uh, we also compared with benchmarks, uh, one near nearest neighbor, so several variants of random forest, and we show that we're doing the best and those are definitely underfitting. And this number is actually what's called chemically 
accurate. That is, this, it is accurate enough that even the simulation, you can only expect a point, oh, point 0.1, um, you're, you're expecting point 0.1 you know, error rate for even simulations that people use nowadays everywhere. And our software um, and things. So uh, quickly I come to the conclusion. We're building the first large scale big data application towards chemical compound prediction using deep learning. And network is not that deep, but we open a field of you know, uh, deep learning that can be used in, in materials uh, d data discovery. And we try to build a model that are seemingly far-fetched but effective by using only atomic fraction and, and lead to a complex compounds compound um, property, and we intend to omit the structural intricacies that is, even for the same composition, sometimes the structure can be different, but we'll try to ignore that. Hopefully the network ca can capture that by itself, and by doing this, we're kind of building a bridge between machine learning and automated dis scientific discovery, which we think will be the next big thing. Okay, thank you. That will be all.